Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. Today we interview Kamel Menour, who is a very well-known art dealer, art lover, art specialist, a man who has dedicated his life to art since the very beginning, right? I mean, you started young, uh, selling prints and minor works in big malls or large spaces, and then later you opened in 1999 your first space, your personal yes. space in Rue Mazarine in Paris, in the 6th um, arrondissement. And uh, you started uh, with photography, right? That's the way you you started your gallery. Yes, it was in 1999 after some years of, you know, getting to this territory, which was totally um, new for me. I I did a master of economics, so I didn't come from the art territory and I had to learn. So with during that time, I was selling prints and small paintings, very commercial in commercial centers, but I was reading and reading and reading and reading a lot. And by the way, reading all those books, I read a lot of books of photography. And I thought that showing photography in Paris could be uh, something very special, pertinent. And I was lucky because there was a boom of photography in Paris after America. And it was just before the fair, this fair uh, photography, Paris Photo. And I was surfing on that. And, you know, we were doing monograph shows, exhibition at the gallery at that time, showing artists like Annie Libovitz, Peter Beard, Stephen Shaw, Araki, Moriyama, Roger Balen, Martin Parr, many of those which were not shown in Paris at the time. And I was the first and I was lucky enough to have this opportunity. But then photography became very important in France. You have also the events in Arles. In yes, that's France. right. At that time, I was very close friend with uh, Lucien Clerc, who introduced me to some of the most important uh, photographers at the time. And it was before Maya Fman, before Luma. At that time, Arles was very dedicated to vintage photography. So there was incredible shows that I could see there. Gary Vinogrant or Lee Miller, many interesting American photographers that I could discover there. So it was a very good moment, a synergy between Arles, that's right, and Paris. You went in 2003 to Art Basel, and 2003 is a year where you decided to diversify your activity. You know, that photography was not enough. Yes. And so you tried to have new young artists among them, uh, if I am not wrong, you had Daniel Burin, Claude uh, Levesque, Martin Parr, François Morclet, and others. Yes, that's right. But the new emerging artists were more artists like um, Camille Enro, Petri Talilay, Latifa Echak, Alicia Quade, young artists. The artists that you were mentioning were the third part, Buren and Morlet, were already very famous. When I got to the contemporary art territory, I went to find and to look for very young artists, unknown artists. And I was in charge of accompanying them to, you know, Biennale, exhibitions in museums, bringing them in fairs like Art Basel, that's right. And it was the beginning of a new era for the gallery. And we were at that time in 2005, 2006, 2007. And in 2007, your work was going rather well, and you decide that Mazarin, Rue Mazarin, uh, it's too small by yes. itself. And so you buy a 400 square meter hotel particulier in Rue Saint André des Arts. Exactly, right. In, in order to have more space, and you inaugurate this with a personal show of Daniel Burin, or Burin, I don't know how you pronounce it. Yes, Daniel Burin, yeah, yeah, right, who was at the time extremely, extremely uh, known. I mean, getting to this hotel particularly was offering to the artists that I was interested with, like Burin or Anish Kapoor or those artists, a space to express themselves. Because in this very small boutique, you know, it was 
a magazine chaussure. It was very small at the time, but it was as I was. I couldn't pretend to something else in 99, 2000, 2001. But, you know, getting after four, five, six years, many people were expecting to the gallery and offering to the artist this hotel particularly was the way to expand and to progress and to have opportunity to welcome bigger artists and bigger and bigger and bigger. So you are obliged to get bigger because, again, in 2013, you have to double your space. You have to yeah. go to 6 Rue yeah. du Pont de Lodi yeah. to open another yeah. big space. Suddenly you have three different spaces in Paris. Yeah, that's right. Because, you know, my competitors are extremely strong and I had to offer the opportunities to the artists to express themselves in other spaces also, because, you know, when you are dancing with the same music, at the end, you are getting bored. So you want to have other musics. So getting other spaces was a way to offer new spaces to the artist. And it was a way also to expand. My competitor at the time were very strong, like Gagosian, Svirner, Hauser & Wirth, uh, Pace, Listen, big galleries also. So I was competing with them. So I had to offer to my artist also other ways to express and to write a new chapters. You mentioned uh, Anish Kapoor and Daniel Bruin. Yeah. But uh, you, yes. among your artists, there are Pierre Paolo Cazzolari, Philippe Pareno, yes. Hugo Rondinon. I mean, you have many others and that yeah. came into your family, let's say. Yeah, it, it's exactly that. It was exactly a family. I wanted to welcome a kind of DNA of artists who could understand what we wanted to express, crossing, you know, young artists, emerging artists and established artists and most of the very interesting artists, young artists came to us and also some of the most established, you know, like you were referring, Calzolari or Pareno or Rondinone, Liu Fan also, you know, Kawamata, Wan Yongping. Many artists came to us because they saw that we were one of the maybe the interesting artists, the gallery in Paris. And, you know, at the time, Paris was totally forgotten and from 2012, 13, 14, Paris got very sexy and exciting. It was the time that the fair FIAC was booming. There was a new foundation in Paris, Fondation Pinot, the Fondation of Bernard Arnault and BMH. There was the Fondation Lafayette. There was Cartier coming, you know, Art Basel came also. And they were a very interesting moment for Paris. And I could say maybe I was part of this to be part an actor of the team, the art scene, to make a very interesting position for Paris as a big place in the world map for art. Yeah, because Paris was very important, the center of the world until yeah. the war. Yeah. Then the art scene, because of the war, because of many things, moved to New York. And especially yes. after 1964, when Rauschenberg yeah. won the yeah. Venice Biennale, yeah. and therefore yeah. American artists became very prominent, somehow Paris lost its power. It and then you had some movements in London, around galleries of like Anthony Dauphay or things like this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. London was also becoming more important. And Dauphay was, for me, someone that was really following. I was, because he was extremely preeminent, important. He offered mostly his collection to the Tate. And for me, it was a model. So that's right. Paris was totally collapsing after 64 with Rosenberg, winning the Golden Lion in Venice. And for me, I was reading a lot of this art history and I was asking myself why Paris could collapse so fast and differently. So I was trying to work with some of my competitors in Paris, you know, and to try to reestablish the preeminent position because of not only me, of course not, but, you know, some of the, you know, Emmanuel Perrotin or Chotin Cruzel, Tadeusz Kropak. We worked very hard to bring Paris again in the map. And now we could say that Paris is extremely, extremely desirable for collectors, for museums, for foundations. You see all the, uh, some of my very good uh, competitors uh, opening in Paris. So it became again a new space. No more a sleeping beauty, right? No more a sleeping lady or sleeping beauty. That's right. Definitely. <laughs> but yeah. I read something of you that, um, that it's interesting uh, because what you did, you know, is a bit the advice I think you gave to new 
galleries to understand the zeitgeist, the, the spirit of the time in which we live. And you probably understood that when you started, right? That's why you stayed in Paris. Yes. It's exactly zeitgeist. And also, I couldn't understand why Paris was so premium and so important, welcoming the most important artists all over the world coming to Paris. And one, in a way, Paris collapsed totally. And, you know, I was thinking in a sociological way and also with some other industries, you know, we were speaking about at the time of the boom of the French touch in music, in techno music. I was thinking about the fashion industry who was still in Paris and I was thinking why France in art collapsed so much. So I was, it was a goal for me because I love my city. I was born and raised in Paris and I love my city and I, I'm extremely happy now to see the vibrant moment for the city in art and in other businesses. So it's a good moment. Anyway, if I am not wrong, you know, at least since the COVID or even before, the art world has moved. In other words, you had Paris and New York and in Paris again. But I mean, besides London, there is uh, Korea, there is Hong Kong, there is Mexico, there is LA, there are, and Miami, and many, many other places around the world, right? Yes. Yes, there's and, a gl- globalization. That's right. There's different mm-hmm. spots now, you know. I'm part of that because I'm participating to all those fairs all over the world. You were mentioning Hong Kong, I'm there. Seoul, I'm there. Miami, I'm there, you know, New York, I'm there. There's the globalization. There's collectors and museums and foundations all over the world. So before, between in the middle of the last century, there was everything in Europe, everything in Paris. And now there's different spots. But I would say Paris came back as a very important place, I would say. But you say somewhere that... um You told about all the fairs where you participate and so on, so long. But since the pandemic, there is fewer fairs and more digitalization, right, in the business. Yes, yes. yes. That's right. There was definitely an acceleration of all actors, you know, artists, foundations, museums, galleries, to work in material way. I'm doing a virtual exhibition in my villa in Cap Dai, next to Monaco. There's not physicality. There's only some images that I will send in internet. Behind there's a, a capour, you can see. So it means that now you don't have to travel when you have a certain reputation and of serious. You can send images. You know, I will ask one of my photographers to do some beautiful photo of the space. And, you know, I'm doing a virtual show here in Cap but, so. but it's different from the physical experience you have yes. if you go to the gallery, right? I mean, of you see beautiful okay. images, but you don't see the real thing. That's right. And they are still a very important physicality, which is extremely important. That's why I would say fair still have predominance because people need to smell, to be touched by the 2D or the 3D uh, object or image. And this is not the end of the art. I mean, virtuality helps people not to travel too much. You know, when someone is looking for a work of Anish Kapoor, I can send him this image and he can say, I like it or I don't like it. And we can bargain and speak about the work. It's another way of promoting artworks. But I would say definitely art needs to be a feel by people and, you know, to be touched in different ways, you know, with your brain, with your smell, with your eyes, but to get close to the work. You talked about this team, this family of artists that you have created or you keep on creating over the years, right? So obviously you have gained importance, therefore you have more famous artists or established artists. But how do you pick up, what makes you decide that this completely unknown person will be a future good artist? And how many of these ones that you picked, you know, let's say you pick 10 new people, right? How many then keep on going and become famous artists? That's a very, uh, very interesting question, but it's so difficult. When I'm picking and when I'm selecting an artist, that I have the sense that this artist can be in the DNA of the gallery and it can 
even if it's not close to some others, but they had something very particular that I can become obsessed with this work. So I want to create this joint situation in which you have different uh, characters and, and being what I would say in a pretentious way called DNA manure. Can you explain me what is the DNA manure? What is your DNA? DNA I can, if I compare myself to DNA Ropac or DNA Perrotin, everyone in Paris or in Fairs would say it's totally something very special. I mean, it's difficult for me to express this, but they would say some of the most interesting emerging artists who are now with me, Petrit Alilai, for example, is on the roof of the Metropolitan. Camille Ro has a beautiful show now in, in Stromboli. I mean, some of the very interesting young artists getting to the most interesting places. Philippe Parino did this beautiful show in Le Museum in Seoul. I would say those are the young artists, I would say, very contemporary. And some of the very accomplished, preeminent artists of the last century and the beginning of the new century, you know, Kapoor or Liu Fan or Rondinon or Kawamata or Wan Yongping. I mean, They are not like an ism, like it was in the last century. You know, it's not a, a school, but they are speaking with the same language, inventing a new expression of art. And I would say I can be very happy and proud of that, you know, to have create a join in a situation in which you have those marvelous artists. You are close to immigrants because you are yourself of a family of immigrants from Algeria, yeah. right? Yeah. But uh, the world of art lately in the last years has changed a lot because uh, more and more gender type of people, I mean, it's much more open to other kind of artists. And probably, I don't know, I'm not sure about that, but uh, the very emerged artists, you know, who were mostly Western artists, or even if they were not Western, they were part of the system, things have changed. They have changed in the auctions, they have changed in museums, they have changed in the way people expose the artist. Now, what do you think about this and how do you react? Is this a fashion, a moment, or is this what the art will be from now on? I mean, that's right. Since some, I would say, 20 years, art brought the word to some of the unspoken people, you know, like feminism, genders, minorities, artists from other territory like uh, African, Asian. And I was very aware of that. I don't know if it's because I came from Algeria or something like that. I'm extremely Algerian, but I'm extremely, extremely French. I was raised, I had a diploma in France, so I'm very much French. But maybe I was very sensitive on that and giving the world to feminism. It was part of that, of the DNA of Menor, maybe. We have a lot of women artists. Also, maybe about the idea of the gender. It's my generation. We need to give the world to those people, you know. We have a lot of artists who are gays. And also, I would say, to answer precisely to your question, Petri Talilaj, who is from Kosovo, Moed Bourissaf, who is from Algiers, Latifa Eshak, who is from Morocco, even Anish Kapoor, even if he's in English, he hates that we brought him back to his Indian roots, but also he is and he was a migrant, you know. And I can summarize my answer to the title of the last Venice exhibition, The title was Stranger Everywhere. So the title of the show gave the words to some of the people who were never in the scene, you know, like gays or people from different countries who are not very much in the front place, you know. So maybe the DNA of the gallery is a little bit of that about that. And you know, I am very proud that this last exhibition in Venice, and the title was from some of our artists, you know, Clairefontaine. I don't know if you saw this beautiful installation in the Arsale with all those neon in different languages, you know, saying strangers everywhere, in Italian, in French, in German, in Korean, in Japan, in Hebrew, in Arab. I'm extremely happy and proud of that, you know, that the art world is very sensitive of different direction now. And we are very much in the post-colonial. I mean, in France, people yeah. like Picasso... I mean, I know that this word 
is not to be pronounced today, but they called it yeah. Art Negre, no? At the time, the black yeah. art, you know, copying or taking inspiration by Africa and all that. And now it's the opposite. I mean, it's the artists who come to the yeah. West. You know, watching the Art Negre, it was totally normal, you know. And now, first of all, we can't. And it's because it's also now that, you know, it's mostly Western artists who could be inspired and African artists who express themselves with the Western. So it's really a very changing time. And art was... So it's a very, to make a long story short, it's a very uh, lively moment in the world yes, of art, right? Exactly. It's lively for Paris, the forgotten Paris who comes back yeah. as one of the most important centers again, and the world change of artists. No? Yes. Artists can be Chinese, Koreans, Africans, yes. yeah. Mexicans, whatever. In all that, in your conversation, you said that you like the idea of creating a family of artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're also a family man. You have five children. You have uh, the same wife since a very long time, the mother of your yeah. children. That's against the times of today, in a way, you know? I mean, you give a lot of importance to your family, right? And very important, yeah. When we started after university with my wife, we were no one, no money. Even she came from a very aristocratic family in Germany. But, you know, when I, I had the luck to build a family, for me, it was very important to got this parallel between my business and also my family. And uh, having my family behind with me gave me a lot of strength, a lot of basis, you know, so it helped me a lot. You have this gallery, you have all these artists, you go around the world, yeah. the art world is changing. What about clients? I mean, when you say, or oh, the taste, when you say zeitgeist, you know, the spirit of the time, what are people looking for today? And who are the people who are collecting art? Are they the same ones or there is a change in that? No, very big change. You know, when I started an opening of Vernissage, there was only... 10, 15, 20 people. Now, when we are having an opening, it's huge. And we have people sometimes traveling from different cities to visit, you know, some of the shows that we are doing. Not only me, the other galleries. So it's totally something different. You know, most of our collectors are in their 40s, very young, you know. So there's a new distribution of collectors. We need to be very aware that we are educating collectors with the artists that we have the opportunity to present. So we are growing together, the artist with his artwork, the gallery and the collector. This is the Trinity. So I'm very interested with the new generation who are getting to collect. So of course, we have very established artists who are very expensive, but we are still presenting a very new generation of artists to offer to this new generation of collectors. So it's very interesting to see the mix of new generation of artists and new generation of collectors. And how is the market today? How are the prices? I mean, they reached huge values in auctions and all that. It looks like that uh, there is a little, not crisis, but I mean, a little decrease on the art. Yeah, of course, there's a decrease. I mean, in yeah. other words, it sounds obvious, but politics in general, we see a world today which is rather uncertain, let's say, right? I mean, in European countries, United States, all these things, Russia, China, Japan. I mean, the world is not tranquil. It had never been tranquil, but particularly yeah. in this moment. So is this influencing the attitude of the collectors, the clients? Of course, I would say collectors now more safe. You know, I would say eight years, 10 years before I was, you know, selling installations and very weird sculptures. And now collectors are more safe with classical intention to buy. They are very worried. I mean, Art Basel, the last one in June was very good. And we were all very surprised with all the galleries, my colleagues, which means that everyone was very worried about the situation, the crisis. It's not scriptural, but it's conjectural now. We see that every part of the world has problems, you know, China, America with the elections, which is not a good moment for sales, Europe, which is the beginning of a movement of extreme. So 
I would say collectors now, since one or two years, are mostly buying the same artists, very safe and classics. They don't want to get to new era. So we need to fly with this situation with artists, with the market. Market is always like that, you know, getting from up. I came from economics, so shop on aware, I know what is it, you know, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. So we need to be very... Uh, In any about. case, you said the day I will say it was better before, I will stop, right? I will never say it was better before because people who are saying that are reactionary, which means that you can't live with the past. You need always to be live with the future. I can have, I'm, for that, I'm very Proustian. I have this Madeleine thinking of how it was before, but just after I have this feeling of digest, of, of sense of coffee in my mouth, I go to the future. But I would say when I would become like that, I would go to get fishing in the sea, but I would never be like that. I think, you know, having this sense of the past, it's finished for you. Tell me something. You don't only work on your gallery, right? Or at least the gallery has many facets nowadays. For instance, you created the Menu Institute, a yeah. research institute of history of art, right? Yeah. And uh, you do a lot of things, uh, research and history of art, you give two grants of a PhD, yeah. you give an award, Eugène Carrière, we yeah. have seminars with the Ecole du Louvre, you do yeah. master classes with artists and creators, you help visits of students, yeah. families, yeah. I mean, you do a lot of work let's say, educational work, no, in a way. Yes. For me, it's what I call maybe a new chapter of the gallery. I want to welcome and to invite and to be a territory of knowledge, of sharing knowledge, you know, so this masterclass, scholarship, grants, and charities. For example, since 10 years, I'm doing a charity for a hospital to help, and you know, the research for genetics illness. This was part of my, not DNA, it's not that, but being a citizen and when you can give back, you know, I came from nowhere. I read a lot of books. I became one of the actors. And at that moment, I'm 57. I have the opportunity to give back. So we hired some very interesting, good people. Number two of Orsay Museum came to us two or three years before. We have uh, Sylvie Patry, her name. And we have Christian Landet, who was the former director of the Giacometti Foundation. We have Sylvie Leslie, um, Compan, who was the director of Brunswick, I brought around me a team of people who are extremely good in history of art, in modernity, and this knowledge, this base of art, I want to share it with new people. I mean, to students, to teenagers, to schools, to searchers. This is part of what we call the gallery. The gallery is a free territory, 99% of people who are getting to the gallery, to my or to others, it's free. So it's a fantastic opportunity for people to see art and to have knowledge, you know. So if I can do it at my position, it's a gift that I'm giving to myself because having this in my brain is very important, very positive. And it's also a gift that I give to the to people. And with this new French institutions that you were mentioning before, right? The Louis yeah. Vuitton Foundation, the yeah. Place de la Bourse, Pino yeah. Foundation, the Maya Hoffman, Luma in Arles, and others who are yeah. the Cartier Foundation and all yeah. this. Are you working close to these kind of foundations? Are you I mean, Spence. galleries? And, and yeah, very, very close. You know, we are dealing now something with uh, Suzanne Pagé at Fondation Louis Vuitton. A, very, a, a daily conversation with uh, François Pinault and, uh, you know, all the directors. We are very close with uh, Chris Dercon from the Cartier Foundation, who was the director of the Direction des Musées Nationaux. So those people are very daily, I mean, every week. So that's why Paris became, it's not like uh, all of a sudden, it became because there's a new generation of galleries, new generation of foundation, and also an important museum like uh, Pompidou, even if they are going to close, which and I'm very sad for that because in the moment They're that Paris... They are going to close. They are going to temporary close, no? Yeah. I'm very pessimist for that, you know. The signal for me in this moment, they needed the restoration, which this is totally important. But getting this communication of 
temporary fermeture, you know, it's a resign. You need to do it part by part and saying, you know, we are going to close, I would say, maybe I'm not an architect, but uh, the four and the five elevation and after the lobby or whatever. I'm speaking, I'm flying very often all over the world and everyone is speaking about that the computer is going to close. It's a shame. In that moment, art needs to be always open, 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 open. It's maybe a problem of communication, but I mean, the signal for the international audience is not the best at that moment. Yeah, but there are other museums who sometimes close. It happened in San Francisco. It happened in Portland, in other places of the world where they close for a while because they restored the museum. Where they yeah, were right. Some... MoMA closed, but not entirely. They closed. I mean, the, the free collection has closed and they moved. Yeah art somewhere else, you know, yeah. so maybe the Bobur collection will move to other places around the world. And it's the vision of my dear friend, Laurent Lebon. He wants to create satellites of the collection, you know. Let's see. Let's see. So you're not too worried about it. No, I'm not too worried. Paris is in a very good moment now. It is strange because, yes, in a sense, you have Olympic Games, but in the other sense, it was quite a political... Uh, difficult moment, you know, sudden difficult moment. Is this influencing the world of art or the world of art is something international and different that is not influenced by the local politics? We can't say that it's not influenced. I mean, the art world is a very sensitive of situation of what is happening, recession, changing political vision, of course. I mean, now I'm not in Paris. I fly to south of France, to Riviera, because I, I don't want to be part of this circulation. It's very difficult to live in Paris now. So just after Basel, people of France, of Paris, shifts, you know. No one knows, and no one could imagine what could happen with these elections, you know. It was uh, surreal. Who could imagine that uh, we would be here within one month? No one knows. And even today, this morning, no one knows. Who would be the prime minister? No one knows. They are trying to negotiate. I would say I would be a prophet to know what would be the next two or three weeks. Very Tell strange. Something. You had a space in London, but are you yes. planning to open a gallery or something in other countries? You know, some of these galleries you mentioned have galleries yeah. everywhere. Yeah, this was my statement and position. Definitely, I thought that I would be only based in Paris. I did this opening in London for three, four years. I was very close with the owner of one of the space. So we did this deal together. It was very easy. I was in Mayfair in the Claridges. But when Brexit came, I left. I saw that it was not me. Kamel Menour in, in London was not me. I was not there. I had a huge apartment there in Grandworth Square, but I was never there. So it was not me. And as you said before, raising my family, five kids, same wife, I saw that there's different options. You can be David Zwirner or Hauser and Wiers or, or Ropak, but you can also be Sally Coles, Xavier Ufkens, some of the very important dealers, but in their only cities. You know, Sally Coles is only in London. Xavier Ufkens is only in Brussels. Now that you are established or so, do you have artists that you would like to represent, that you would like to have in your family? You have some dreams left. Many. Can you, can you, you tell know, me some of these dreams? If I was like a, a trainer in a, of a football team, I can't let you know if I want to sign this player, if I didn't already spoke with him, you know. There's artists that I'm very having dreams and challenges, but artists are like beautiful women. You need to seduce them. You need to explain them the vision. And you can't tell it before having this in reality. Within the next... Six next months, I think I will confirm two new artists, very important artists. What is your technique? I mean, what is your seduction technique? There are also artists, but for instance, like you publish books, they're like writers, right? Sometimes, yeah. you know, they are in a very good publishing house, but suddenly something happens or yeah. they don't feel anymore at ease and then they change. They look yeah. for changing. As you said, you know, we are a publishing company also. I mean, we are publishing pro bono books, which means that it's not to earn money, it's only to distribute and to explain. You know, we did the last book of Eugène Carrière, an artist of the 19th century, and we are not selling it. It's just to offer to curators, to foundation, to museum. 
getting to, to those artists, you need also to explain the vision, to seduce, to show your area of complexity with museum, with foundation. I would say now after 25 years, I mostly know the most important directors of museum that I can contact directly and explain. So an artist needs to have this assistance to be close to a gallery who has not only commercial position, but also connection with Biennale Foundation, you know, it's helpful for them. So I would say getting to an artist, I'm, you know, sometimes explaining that and I'm saying, if I would be you, I would go with me. Why should they come with you? What I was telling you, I mean, my connection, I would say maybe in France, I'm one of the galleries who is the most connected museum with foundation, you know, some of the artists who went with us had, you know, shows in, in museum. And an artist, one of his goals is to get access to shows, monographs in, in museum. So for that, I would say we are very connected with, you know, some of the artists call us because they know that we are very efficient on that. It's not only commerce, it's not only money, it's also connection, you know. And this is maybe also the, an answer for your question of the DNA of the gallery. We are extremely, extremely close to museum and foundations. Which are growing, as you said before, in Paris. But you probably have connections also with other kind of museums like State Modern or the Serpentine in London or the MoMA in New York and so on and so forth. So. Francis, yeah, of course. And Francis and, and Solrich, of course. You know, those are connections for us. We did many shows with them, so they know that we are serious and very efficient, and we deliver. You know, working with us, we had just last month, we had a beautiful show of Liu Fan at the Rex Museum, you know, in Amsterdam. So every month, every week, we have shows of the artists we are working with to museums. You are in Paris. There have been, obviously, moments in which there were many important French artists. Then over the years, less. Do you think that uh, you said the art scene is quite alive today again in Paris, but do you perceive also that there are many more artists or French artists who have the possibility of becoming worldwide artists or not? Yeah. Is it a place where artists now come to work as they did before or not? Or not? Um, it's a very interesting question. Paris was considered because as... you see, besides the Impressionists, right, which was basically starting as a French movement, and therefore there were lots of great artists that we all know from, you know, Manet, Monet, Renoir, and so on and so forth. But then Paris, in between the two wars, all the greatest writers, artists were in Paris. Picasso, Picabia, Giacometti, and obviously Matisse, who was a French artist himself. Now that you say it's a renaissance of Paris, can there be a renaissance without the artists, or there are also the artists? No, it can't be. I mean, a renaissance needs to go with the artists. So that's right. Paris was considered for many years the last years, the two or three last decades, as a museum city, not only an art scene. It's because rents and studios, ateliers were extremely expensive. I mean, artists go in which it's cheaper, you know. That's why there was the boom in the, the 90s, 2000, 2010 of Berlin, because it was very cheap. But since, you know, some of the artists now are leaving their city to come to Paris, you know, Hugo Rondinon just bought, uh, he was established in, in New York. He just bought a beautiful studio in, in Paris uh, lately, two years before. It's a signal. Uh, Liu Fan now is in Paris. Capour that I was with last month, who came with his wife, he wanted to buy something in Paris. I mean, there's a signal. It can't be in one day, but we see that there's something coming. But I'm... Um, telling to Mérite Paris or to Emmanuel Macron that we need to help this and to assist artists to come, even with uh, some free spaces to, to offer, because artists, they can't come if it's too expensive or too luxurious. They need to come in spaces, maybe even if it's gentrification, but to help and to bring a creation in our city. And I'm very much believing in that. And I'm sure that in the next years, the artists will come more and more. If I would be an artist, 
I would come to Paris now. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interview. Alan L. Can interviews.